Hello everyone, this is Jen and I make useful English Lit study videos on Shakespeare, poetry, fiction, literary devices and more to help you get top grades in the subject. So in this video today we are going to be close reading Carol Ann Duffy's War Photographer, which is another one of the poems in the AQA GCSE Pan Conflict Anthology. So let's dive straight into this. So first of all, as always, we're going to take a look at the poet's background. So, so Caroline Duffy is probably no stranger to um, you guys who have been studying English literature for a while. She is arguably one of the most celebrated British poets of all time, especially when we're looking at contemporary British poets. So she was born in 1955 in Glasgow in Scotland, and she's currently living in Manchester after moving from London in the 80s. She's now currently holds the uh, position of creative director at the Manchester Metropolitan University Writing School. From 2009 to 2019, she was the Poet Laureate, being the first ever female Scottish and lesbian holder of the position. So part of what makes Duffy so incredible is that she is immensely prolific. There's probably more than 30 anthologies to her name and on average she publishes one anthology every one to two years. So just incredibly prolific. And she's also actually a, an accomplished playwright having published a couple of dramatic works. She's the winner of numerous literary awards including the Somerset Norm Award granted to her in 1988, the T.S. Eliot Prize in 2005, and she's also a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature since 1999. So Duffy's poetry often deals with ideas of femininity and feminism, identity, gender, and also social inequality and injustice. What makes her poetry accessible but also sophisticated is that the language she uses is often demotic, but there's always a sensitivity to technical precision in her poems. So for example, she often adapts and reappropriates traditional poetic forms like the sonnet and the dramatic monologue, and she reworks them to illuminate more modern considerations and themes. So some scholars have placed Duffy at the intersection between romantic and Victorian poetic traditions. For instance, her plain spoken register and interest in the sort of everyday sublime, the sort of beauty in the uh, pedestrian, kind of aligns her with William Wordsworth. But also her technical experimentation with the dramatic monologue associates her with Browning, who was of course famous for his use of the dramatic monologue to explore moral dilemmas, as in the Last Duchess or Porphyria's Lover. And also Duffy's exploration of gender, womanhood and feminism and places her in the sort of literary lineage with George Eliot, who wrote works such as Middlemarch and The Mill on the Floss. So before we dive into the stances, let's take a look at the poem's title and specifically its central character, The War Photographer. So when we read this title, we already know that we're being invited to explore the memory and perspective of a war photographer. So who is a war photographer? Right? What does he do? And what makes him, um, and of course it can be a her, but in this poem it's clearly a him, and what makes this war photographer such an intriguing character for study? So a war photographer is perhaps someone we can think of as what we call a liminal character. Because unlike a soldier, a war photographer is not fully involved in the main action of war. But unlike ordinary civilians like ourselves who are not affected by the war in question, the war photographer isn't completely detached from the experience of war either. So instead, he is an observer who is perched on the sidelines as someone who witnesses all the incidents and details of the battlefield for his work but will and can never stick a hand in the situation to make any sort of material change. So his job as a war photographer is a passive one because his task is often to simply record and document whatever he sees in war. So there's little agency to the role of a war photographer. And as we go on to read the poem, we're gonna see that the photographer's lack of agency becomes a key source of frustration and trauma for him. 
at this point, I think a bit of context would be helpful. So the poem was published in 1985, by which year the Vietnam War had ended for a full decade. So apparently Duffy was friends with one of the most celebrated British war photographers at the time, who was called Don McCullen. And McCullen was known for his raw, naturalistic and emotionally resonant photographic portrayal of warfare. And so inspired by his work from the Vietnam War, Duffy wrote War Photographer as a possible character study of McCullen and also those of his profession. So out of the Vietnam War emerged strong pacifist sentiments in both the UK and the US. And part of that was probably also because people were constantly reminded and bombarded by images of suffering that military conflict imposes on humanity. And this was partly reinforced by the rise of vivid graphic representation of mediums such as photography and television. So naturally then those who were involved in the business of creating these visual reminders of war would have dealt with a different a more internal kind of battle in their minds as they wondered about the value of them documenting all of these instances of human cruelty and pain. So the first stanza sets the scene for what's an eerie, haunting and almost satanic kind of atmosphere with the references to his dark room. The only light is red. And the unsettling metonymy of those spools of suffering set out in ordered rows. So these spools of suffering refer to the photographic film on which those scenes of war, suffering and pain are captured by the photographer. Now, all of this seems a bit ironic when we reach line five, with the analogy of the photographer being compared to a priest preparing to in tone a mass. So this juxtaposition of demonic and holy forces introduces the first set of tension in this poem, which is that between good and evil. So in most Christian and by extension Western societies, this moral dichotomy is often invoked as the pretext for human conflict, as a battle between the forces of good and evil. And we often hear that being invoked as a pretext or a reason for waging war. But the question is, at what cost? Is it really worth it? So there's a suggestion then that while warmongering politicians and nations may often believe themselves to be delivering some kind of good, which is characteristic of the many civilizing missions waged by crusader states throughout history, right? for example, from the Belgian colonization of the Congo in the late 19th century, all the way down to the 21st century American invasion of Iraq. So even with the sort of conviction that they're somehow delivering good through necessary evil, their legacy is usually no more than atrocity and grave human tragedy, while most of the world just looks on with a kind of cold apathy as they go about living their lives with little awareness of the pain that's experienced by war-affected societies and peoples. Now, beyond the obvious deaths and destruction that come out of war, war also creates a less obvious but no less problematic effect. After a while, death becomes so prevalent that it is normalised. And with this normalisation of death comes a kind of numbing indifference. Because when you see a lot of something, you no longer feel the sense of shock that you once did upon seeing the first death, right? with the hundredth death, with the thousandth death that you see, it all becomes a bit pedestrian. It all becomes a bit, oh, here's another one then. So when people who are supposedly individuals of flesh and blood are slaughtered en masse, they begin to lose their individual currency and their unique value, but are instead viewed as no more than just this literal mass of things. Their bodies scatters across tarmac as the biblical allusion to all flesh is grass in line six reminds us of the transience and impermanence of human life. And this is a phrase which is taken from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Now, there's also the wordplay of mass, actually, mass. 
It's a wordplay that carries a hint of sadness because it exposes the hypocrisy the war photographer feels. Because the only mass that's real are those masses of dead bodies on the battlefield. Those countless unnamed and innocent civilians being the real Jesus Christs of unjust martyrdom. Right, That's necessitated by war and conflict. So each of the millions of individuals who died as a result of brutal warfare in places like Belfast, Beirut, Phnom Penh, they're all forgotten. And their only trace of existence is contained in a crass, throwaway, geographical allusion to these places. And their relationship with the world is severed just as these words are chopped up by the blunt caesura, as you can tell from these full stops between Belfast, Beirut, Phnom Penh, and also the throbbing trochaic rhythm of Belfast, Beirut, Phnom Penh, right? And so these people who die as a result of war, their unique identities are all of a sudden lumped into a ghastly imagery of bodies as a heap of carcasses on the battleground. Individuality, all of that is stripped and generalised as just this place, this unfortunate location where war and conflict once took place. Now, carrying on this tension between the general and the specific, the first sentence of stanza two reads curiously vague. It says, he has a job to do. Well, what job? But the sense of mystique here seems a bit unnecessary, right? Because we all know that the photographer's job at this moment is to develop his film and to bring to light those moments he had captured from the war. So why does the speaker state the obvious. Now we find out in the next line that perhaps it's because with trembling hands, the photographer is reluctant to do his job. And so he has to remind himself, I have a job to do and I must do it. All the while not actually emotionally up to the task. And he's not up to the task because these scenes of human brutality, violence and tragedy he had captured, now that he looks at them again, are too harrowing for him to see again, to bear and to remind himself of. Now, as we continue to read through the rest of the poem, we actually notice that ambiguity recurs time and again in the form of vague, cryptic statements that deliberately skirt the concrete specifics. For example, as in, his hands, which did not tremble then, though seem to now. So what happened then? And why does the photographer feel different now? Then and now are not clear. Or in line 13, something is happening. Again, super fake. What is this something that is happening, right? Or in line 16 to 17, how he sought approval without words, to do what someone must. Why is the photographer referred to as a random someone, right? And what is this thing that someone must do? Or towards the end of the poem, in the final two lines, from the aeroplane he stares impassively at where he earns his living and they do not care. Where does he earn his living? And who are the they who don't care? So these unspecified pronouns and words perhaps suggest the photographer's desire to escape from the reality of his work, his identity, and most importantly, his memory. Because the idea of him having ever witnessed the death of a soldier and having heard the cries of this man's wife and yet was unable to do nothing more than to take a photo of it, haunts him like this half-formed ghost. So if the photographer cannot get away from his mind, then at least he could try to wash off the specific colours and contours of his memory with the ambiguity of language. So could it be then that this linguistic evasiveness is the poet's way of showing us the photographer coping with what could otherwise be too painful to recall. Now, there's also this allusion to rural England in the second stanza. 
in line 9. And this provides an interesting counterpoint to the Belfast, Beirut and Phnom Penh allusions in line 6. Because it ironically suggests that while home in rural England is technically safe, it doesn't heal the photographer from those deep incisions of having witnessed war. He is here merely transported from one form of pain to another. Home again, he feels ordinary pain, which simple weather can dispel. Ordinary pain is still pain. But those imprinted thoughts of running children in a nightmare heat remain and they cannot ever be dispelled or unremembered. Now, like stanza two, stanza three opens with the ambiguous statement, something is happening that I just mentioned. Now, literally, this something refers to the gradual processing of the films in the photographer's darkroom. Right? But atmospherically, this process is depicted as the horrific reliving of a nightmarish memory. The haunting echoes of this experience is borne out by perhaps the internal rhymes of something something is happening a stranger's features you hear these haunting echoes within line 13 and also the end rhyme of eyes and cries in lines 14 and 15 so this sudden onslaught of rhyming words suggests a kind of ricocheting echo right that he keeps replaying in his mind just like those memories that keep replaying in his mind now the half-formed ghost metaphor of the dying soldier the photographer recalls taunts his conscience which is already weighed down by his guilt over having only watched from the sidelines and capitalizing on a moment of inhumane tragedy for his professional work right because he is a war photographer and it is his job to just simply take a photo of these moments but the irony of how he sought approval without words to do what someone must is that he never actually sought the man's wife's approval to take the picture and while there is technically nothing wrong with what he did, he's left with the remorse of having exploited an occasion or even of someone's life to fulfill the tasks demanded by a job that all of a sudden seems so inconsequential and meaningless in comparison to that of the dying soldier. Now, in the same way, then, that washing out the concrete through vague language serves as a means of escape for him, the metonyms of how the blood stained into foreign dust offer the photographer a way of separating the sufferer from the suffering. So the blood could be a stand-in for the slaughtered soldier and also of separating the factual from the emotional. For example, the dust being this remnant of the shelling and bombing on the battlefield. Right? So simply thinking about just the speck of dust is going to perhaps evoke much less traumatic memories and emotions than recalling the entire situation, the shelling and the bombing and the dying. So if the photographer cannot avoid recalling those memories of war, then perhaps he could at least try to not think about the person whom he saw in the throes of death, because engaging with that would just be too depressing to bear. Now, as we reach the final stanza of the poem, the greatest tragedy comes to light. Because as horrendous and ghastly as the deaths and violence on the battlefield may be, just as cruel, if not even crueler, are those who are unaffected by war because they go about their daily business of work, eat and sleep, just as someone else somewhere dies in the most brutal, tragic way. So for newspapers, war is simply a commodity and each moment it provides as an opportunity for its staff to take a photo is an opportunity to grab readers' attention and to generate revenue, as we can tell from lines 19 to 21. A hundred agonies in black and white from which his editor will pick out five or six for Sunday's supplement. There's a kind of blasé tone to this. 
So human suffering then is rendered trivial by commercial priorities. And any hint of sadness that one may feel towards the sacrificed lives is quickly forgotten, swept aside by those material, practical considerations of bath and pre-lunch beers. Now, the bath and pre-lunch beers are also examples of metonymy. They are metonyms that represent the sort of middle-class comfort that's so often detached from the grim realities outside their insular orbit of existence. And like the metonym of blood in the phrase, the blood stained into foreign dust in line 18, the synecdoche of eyeballs, the reader's eyeballs, this is synecdoche because eyeballs are part of the reader, it reinforces a desire to separate the moment from the person, right? Because instead of referring to the reader tearing up, the poet chooses to specifies the reader's eyeballs, right, that prick with tears. And so this reinforces that desire to separate the moment from the person, which is similar to what we saw in the previous stanza, the blood being part of the soldier, but not referring to the soldier, the person per se, but just the element of the soldier, the blood. And so the, the reader may feel sad about the unfortunate war atrocities he reads about in the moment he reads about them. But once his eyeballs are directed away from the article, he's going to move on from that sadness. And in this case, it's reflected that any sort of sadness that we, detached from the situation, may feel towards those who are so unfortunate as to be in that situation, this sort of sadness is only ever fleeting and superficial. Now, as a final interesting observation to make about stanza four before we look at the structure and form of the poem as a whole, I want us to pay attention to the last two lines of the poem. From the aeroplane he stares impassively at where he earns his living and they do not care. Now, presumably he is the war photographer, it's simple enough, who is travelling for another work trip as he's about to arrive at a war site, which is probably where he earns his living, right? But the fact that he is viewing what's below from the airplane with this elevated vantage symbolises that existential and emotional disconnect of those who are not directly involved in the cruelty and the action of war. And this detachment is precisely what breeds the sense of impassiveness. But what's surprising is perhaps the fact that his apathy is also met with the apathy of those who are suffering and fighting on the battlefield because they do not care about what the photographer does. And the implication then is that the photographer and what he does doesn't matter compared to the life and death struggles of those battling at the front lines. So now that we've close read the details of each stanza, I want to zoom out and make a few points about the poem's structure and form. As, and as you guys know, being able to comment intelligently about structure and form of any poem is going to set you apart as a top grade lit student. So pay attention here because this part is going to be super important. First, note that there is a recurrent seesawing tension in the rhyming arrangement of the poem. You'll notice that each stanza contains two regular rhyming couplets in the second and third lines, as well as the fifth and final lines. But mixed in are these haphazard, scattered, internal and slant rhymes that appear here and there. So for example, we'll see rows, glows, mass, grass, then, again, feet, heat, eyes, cries, must, dust, six, prick, wear, care. But you'll see that the first line and the fourth line of each stanza are just standalone, unrhymed words at the end. In between this kind of rhyming couplet framework, you'll see that there are these moments when the slant and internal rhymes pop up. For example, in line 13, which is something that we had analysed just now, there's the something is happening, a stranger's features, like all of a sudden you get this string of rhyming words within the same line. So this is an example of internal rhyme. And then you get these moments where there's a sudden slant rhyme. So say, for example, a half-formed ghost, how he sought approval 
without words to do. And so what this tension conveys is perhaps this desire of the photographer to regain a sense of structure and predictability upon his return from every journey to a war site. And that's symbolized by the kind of framing structure of the rhyming couplets in every stanza. But unfortunately, this desire for normalcy is always undercut and disrupted by the sort of traumatic memories that crop up in his mind time and again. And those sort of spontaneous moments of memory cropping up are perhaps symbolised by those haphazard, sudden moments of slant and internal rhymes. So having seen how volatile and erratic life can be for those whose lives are uprooted by war, there is no way that this photographer can live a truly normal, regular life, even when he goes home to rural England to his usual so-called routine. So this tug of war, no pun intended here, between a desire for comforting regularity at home and the reality of a disruptive lifestyle that's constantly on the go is also reflected in the tension between the four sestets throughout the poem and the varied rhythm throughout the stanzas. So from the outside then it may seem like there's the semblance of structure right every single stanza is made up of six lines sestets right and there are these four seemingly regular stanzas but as we dig deeper within these stanzas especially in the syntax we'll notice from the drastic fluctuation of short and long sentences created by Caesarian and enjambment that the photographer's life is underpinned by this pattern of jolting unpredictability. For example, perhaps even just in the first stanza, there's enjambment in the first two lines, in his dark room he is finally alone with spools of suffering set out in ordered rows. Perhaps this enjambment here also kind of nicely visually mirrors this um, the film that he's developing, right? Um, the spools of films um, and there's this windiness to this sentence as well, which is kind of like how rolls of film, they kind of, you know, they're also windy. Um, but then towards the end of the stanza, you get this succession, almost kind of like machine gun-like in rhythm, where it's punctuated by this series of uh, fast-paced full stops, right? Belfast, pause. Beirut, pause. Non pen pause. All flesh is grass, right? Or perhaps even in stanza two, he has a job to do. Midline says zero. Solutions slop and trays beneath his hands. Again, pause. Which did not tremble then, though seem to now. Pause. Rural England. Pause. Right, so um, you'll notice that the rhythm is quite varied and is orchestrated by the sort of elasticity in the tension between the Zezura and the run on lines. Perhaps what this suggests then is that the photographer doesn't know when he'll be posted to another war site and he can never anticipate what he's going to see at these war sites, right? For example, compare the choppiness of Belfast, Beirut, Phnom Penh and Stanza 1 with the run-on overflow of a hundred agonies in black and white from which his editor will pick out five or six or Sunday supplement in Stanza 4. So again, there's a sort of unpredictability to the nature of his profession. So ultimately then we get the sense that while war itself is indeed tragic, the war photographer seems to cut an equally tragic melancholic figure as this man who must make a living out of bearing witness to what he and perhaps no one would ever want to see. And that's it for this video, guys. I hope you found my analysis of War Photographer insightful and helpful for your studies. And as always, if you appreciate my work, please do hit the thumbs up button below. I'd massively appreciate it. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my channel and hit that bell notification button so that you never miss another top grade English Lit Study video from me. You can obviously check out my Power and Conflict playlist in the description below for my analysis of other Power and Conflict poems that you're studying. And finally, don't forget to follow me on Instagram at hyperbolit, where you can direct message me with any questions you may have about your study of English literature. Thanks for watching, and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye!